Thank you for being here today. We are talking about excipients today. Yes, we are. And I All I can say that five times really fast. Excipients, 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 excipients. Okay, oh, formulations, no. or, uh, ingredients. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> That's good. It's going to be I fun. I didn't have to do it. I love it. And, All right. Hey, congratulations to Adrian Who's the winner? Zelski. Ooh. Oh, an extract bag swag bag with hey, a, where's with my a notes? hat. I stole your notes. Okay, no, I got them. We're good. So, well done. Thank you, thank you, thank you for being here. And today, uh, we're going to be talking about all kinds of excipients. Uh, CBD, MCT oil, MCT oil vape, uh, formulations, making CBD oil binders. And I got a little nervous because when we were walking in earlier, yeah, Dr. John walked in with three giant three-ring binders. I'm like, oh, man. <laughs> Yeah, I was like, okay, I'm ready for SOPs. I thought maybe we, <laughs> no tables, but three ring binders. We're oh, going yeah. old school We're today. We're going old school, yeah, <laughs> three ring binders. I think I got I got the colossal stack of binders. So. I love it. And, yeah. you know, some of the other things that we're going to be talking about, CBD lotion, we're going to be talking about bioavailability, emulsions, cannabis tinctures, best CDB, CBD vape oil. Wait, 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 I got to write all this CBD. down. No, it's all right here on my notes. Okay, okay. so as we go, you're on, man. This is good, and I am jazzed. It, and the colors on your presentation are purdy. Yeah, they're purdy. I got uh, a little magenta in with some in, fading into some peach and hot pink. When you started doing this, yeah. any Delta 8 involved? No, no, no. No psychedelics. <laughs> no psychedelics involved. Oh, but it's not psychedelic. Uh, but no. D8. no. <laughs> There's no psychoactive really in sure. D8. All right. Unless you look at some of them and you actually test them, and then it's like, whoo. All right, so let's get started. <laughs> all right, uh, all go. about excipients. So what uh, hey, is J an excipient? James, are we, ready? are we ready to go on the, I, okay, so we're all set. Okay, all about excipients, let's do it. So what the hell is Okay, now excipient? this is like a, the next 30-minute monologue. I'm just going to go, go oh, no, I'll this. interrupt you. Okay. <laughs> Guaranteed. You got, I got your back. <laughs> okay, he's got your back. Okay, all about excipients. Let's talk about it. What is an excipient? So what the hell are they? Well, uh, excipient is more than an ingredient. It's, it's more of an engineered component to a, a formula, okay? okay? And there's a couple different things that you need to think about when, you, when you're selecting your excipients, which I'll get into in a couple slides, but it really is the medium that solubilizes, enhances sorption, okay? Usually you select it to match the way you're going to deliver it. For example, you're not going to put a, you know, like a coconut oil, for example, and, you know, vaporize that, for example, mm. right? That would be an example of something that you wouldn't, you wouldn't normally do Don't because... Don't do that. Well, yeah, don't do that. Don't do that. But usually my point is that the, the excipient is really matches, you know, does it solubilize the active ingredient, yep. which is in our case, hemp and hemp oils and hemp CBD and things like that. Does it enhance bioavailability? It modifies the viscosity sometimes. So if you need to make it less viscous, so it'll yes. work with yep. your method of delivery. And um, so it, it's doing all of those things. So you can see that it's clearly a, a highly engineered component or a highly engineered ingredient gotcha. within the overall mix of stuff. So it, it gets a special name, excipient. And people usually talk about excipients when they're talking about drug and drug delivery. Okay. okay. So it's kind of like a, a drug term. Um, you know, I, I don't know if the people in the food industry typically would say, yes, I'm going to mix up some excipients. <laughs> Yes, I, I mean you don't you don't hear that you know Iron Chef. Okay, oh yes, take the excipient out of the. <laughs> no, I think, I think I say that every day. Well, you know I do. I'm going to uh, mix up some excipients. Yes, can you fill up that coffee maker with some excipient, please? <laughs> 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 we need to make sure the coffee is ground to exactly 200 microns plus minus uh, 10 microns. Oh my God! Uh, I know uh, really? that would be a very fine powder. Yeah, yeah that's, we don't actually do that. That would be anyway, Turkish coffee. So what is, or the, Greek what is coffee. an excipient? An excipient is a, it's a carefully selected medium, uh, provides solubility, enhancement, absorption, modifies viscosity of the active ingredient for subsequent delivery, often formulated with the active and the route of administration, which is, you know, a vapor pen, sublingual under the tongue, yep. right? Okay. Or if it goes into your gut via capsule or a gummy, um, you'd want to have something that's emulsifying in there, um, so it would oh, it would okay. help it would help with bioavailability. So, gotcha. the, so you can see it's it, it's highly you know it's engineered. It's yeah. part of a formulation. Sure. So, um, what's the difference between an ingredient and excipient? 
um, an ingredient is a component of the mixture, like I said, and the excipient is, is just that engineered component, so I already answered that. But let's just kind of talk uh, about the process of formulations and, and how you would go about you know, selecting an excipient for your formulation. The first step really is to establish requirements. And a lot of people kind of skip over that. Okay, I want to make a, a vapor pen or I want to make a, a, a tincture, okay? Sure. And they really don't write down all the requirements for that tincture. So like, for example, how do I want it to taste? How do I want it to look? Do I want it to be clear? Do I want it to, um, is there a certain smell I want or a aroma that I want out of that? Um, you know, what's the packaging? What's the requirements for the packaging? Um, do I want to have it in a certain type of packaging? Sure. Okay. And, and if you write down all of those requirements, okay, associated with the formulation, um, really what it's going to do is going to start you down a path of choosing the right excipients because sometimes uh, excipients are not compatible. For example, if you have like an ethanol excipient for like a sublingual, uh, sublingual, sure. you know, sure. Um, in that case, you, you would it would define certain packaging requirements. Like you would want to have a glass borosilicate package for that, which yep. would be like a glass uh, bottle. Sure. And you would want to also have, you know, the seals on that. You wouldn't want to have it so they were leaching, you know, like the ethanol was getting in there and leaching stuff out into your... Exactly. In, in, ...and contaminating it. So there would... The, the selection of ethanol, for example, for a sublingual, which is, you know, is, um, you know, like a tincture. It's a, yep. Okay. Um, you know, that would be, um, you know, really drive a lot of those packaging requirements. Okay, so you can see how they're going back and forth. Also, conducting a risk assessment. This is something that is required for GMP producers of, of various nutraceuticals and uh, also drug products. I mean, I think that uh, even the food side of this, if you're talking about major amounts of food being produced, you should do a risk assessment. Okay, for example, suppose I have a, a, a cup of coffee right here and I want to, I have certain specifications on the quality of this coffee. I would uh, look at the ingredients of the coffee and I would make sure that, um, that the ingredients themselves could meet the specifications before I brewed the coffee. And if I was only brewing one uh, you know, cup of coffee, the risk is really low. But if I now start to brew, you know, megatons of coffee, okay, I would want to make sure that I'm, I am looking at the batches. I'm looking at all the t specifications. I'd want to make sure that, no, it's not just, uh, you know, I take tap water, put it together and, you know, do a pour over. Okay. It's just not, it's not quite that way. Sure. Right. Yep. So if um, you're doing massive quantities, if you're doing massive quantities. And so the risk goes up as you start to get into manufacturing guys. So that, that all I'm saying there, and the is risk that, went way up on this because didn't I bring this cup to you? Yeah, it did. Risk He's went way up. Some cyanide in there. <laughs> <laughs> Get this guy, get this guy taken It would never be cyanide, but it could be. <laughs> It'd be you know, something else. Amanita, maybe. Oh, how about some scotch? <laughs> we could put some scotch in there. Yeah. Okay, that'd be like good. Okay, so, um, so that would be a risk assessment. And the risk assessment really drives how you control your process, yeah. right? I mean, you don't want to just control your process for the sake of controlling the process. That's the art of quality management, okay? Mm -hmm. It's easy to say, okay, I'm, gonna, I'm going to go into a process and I'm going to control everything. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna do a, a uh, molecularly <laughs> clean spoon so that uh, you know it's <laughs> sterile, and then I have a, a scale that has you know seven decimal points behind the oh my you gosh. know seven significant figures. Okay, none of that. You don't need to do that. Okay, what you would do is you would use a risk assessment. And Isn't you would that say, how we run our plant? It is kind of yeah, it is with a risk assessment. Yeah, and the is. risk the risk assessment says okay, this this is where a key risk. Cross contamination matters. Oh yeah. Okay. Yep. And this is a key risk that we would need to then uh, test. Yep. And um, or uh, if there was a cross contamination of this particular item, whether it's an excipient or whatever, it doesn't really matter. So we wouldn't test it. We wouldn't put the money in it. But you would have a risk assessment there that says, hey, look, there, this is a zero risk to the end product. Mm -hmm. So that that second point of doing a risk assessment, really, you're setting it up. Steps one and two of doing your formulation is really setting it up. You're, you're establishing your requirements. You are establishing your risk assessment. Yep. How many people actually do this? I challenge you guys out there, um, you know, you, you really should think about doing those two things, especially if you have a lot of products going into market. What'll happen is you'll, you'll start to think about things. And once you have your template down, it, it, you know, the risk assessment, you're just checking boxes off and sure. it's gonna help you put out 
a more consistent and product. It's also going to help you put out a less expensive product because if you misidentify the risk and you actually, for example, have an ingredient that comes in and you start mixing up, you know, you know, 80,000 gummies or, uh, you know, 100,000 gummies and you're mixing that all up, well, and one of those has a contaminant in it, but you didn't look at it and then it gets out. Now, where did the contaminant come from? Well, it came from one of my ingredients. Okay, that's something you need to think you about ahead of time. you got to throw out all that batch. you got to throw out all that batch. So then that's where really your risk assessment comes from. So really the ri output of the risk assessment is really where am I going to inspect? What's the accept criteria for each inspection point? What are the uh, quality measures that you guys are going to put in place, like the certificates of analysis? And wh wh who do I really need to deal with on that? And so. that translates directly into revenue and profitability. Absolutely. Because if you don't have a plan, you're going to fail. Right. And the plan and the formulations are critical to how you're going to execute on your, on your plan. So I, I love this. Yeah. So good. There you got your formulation. Step three is really to qualify your vendor. So here I, I've, I've got us. I've got. I've gone through my risk assessment. I've, I've established my criteria. Usually there's a there's an R and D that happens between qualifying sure. your vendor. Actually, the R and D typically will take a vendor and they'll they'll say, okay, well I want I have this vendor and I have this vendor and I have this vendor. Vendor, I'm putting them all together in the formulation. Wow, that really works good. They'll create a bill of materials and then hand that off to the accountants. The accountants will upload it to the MRP system, and then they'll start to uh, qualify it qualify. And, and release that uh, formulations uh, via process into, into production, okay? But typically, as a part of that, you would do a qualification of a vendor. For those of you who are interested, we did a vendor qualification documentation mm -hmm. form that we've already, we've already published, and you guys can use that. It, it works just as well for qualifying a vendor for your pro toll processing as it does qualifying a vendor for, for example, your ethanol um, you know, supplier or your excipient supplier, whatever it may yep. be, coconut oil or MCT oil or yep. even, um, even, your, even your terpenes, for example, if you're sourcing those um, and, and you're, you're making some sort of claim associated with the terpene, yep. okay, you're going to want to be able to qualify that that terpene is actually in there and it's not all degraded and all that stuff. So yeah, and on think on about that. Another one of our shows, we had that. So yeah, we've we got did. that available. So you can ask for that if you want it. Once you get that quality agreement, then typically you're doing a sourcing. Yep. You source the ingredients. Um, and then here's the step that really comes into practice when it comes to, uh, you know, setting up your formulation properly. And that is, okay, so we got it set. We released our product. We got it. Uh, we got our vendors all lined up. We got our bill of materials and we're ready to formulate, right? It's yep. wonderful. Woo. Now you're getting in, um, you're getting an active ingredient. Maybe you're sourcing active ingredient from a bulk bulk or maybe... Uh, whatever they're all coming in and they're going to be checked in and a lot is going to be tracked at that point so um, The source ingredients should have obviously the lot lot tracking done Usually what happens is you get them into your system. You put the lot in you put the data manufacturing you uh, scan in to IGW lab all of the Documents that are associated with that lot mm -hmm. and you put an expiration date in the system So it's all tracking and then you put it into quarantine and then um, the quality assurance person comes and they check it out and they say, okay, this is all the documentation that's associated with this excipient is good and it can be released to production. Check, 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 then check. that goes Ooh. into inventory then, um, assuming that it's not a, um, you know, it could go into a vault, for example, if sure. it was a... Um, if it was a, a active ingredient and th there are usually storage requirements and temperature pressures and all and that, that stuff. that will eliminate temperature humidity that me. issue that you mentioned earlier and that is to have a contaminated ingredient that destroys everything right so test everything you're putting in right right exactly so if you are uh, f suppose you were formulating something with a spice like yep. a okay uh, with a spice okay and uh, you decided to go source it from you know uh, a wholesale spice.com <laughs> okay something like that and you got in a big bag well you don't know where that big bag come from came nope. from and so you should ask them to provide you certifications if you if indeed you think that that could possibly have contamination an issue yeah right one thing uh, kind of interesting i i always when i first started uh with you know doing formulations i always thought i was i was going overboard you know with testing too much um, one time, though, I have this story. Uh, we had um, we had ordered uh, four barrels 
of, uh, was it ethanol? It was like food grade ethanol. Okay. And we got them in on some pallets. Sure. And we, at the time, we were like, okay, we're testing everything. We're just going to do it. And so we did a full, full on testing. We did pesticides, we did toxins, we did heavy metals, um, heavy metals and we d also did uh, some microbials. And of course, n and also just, uh, just to check to see that the ethanol actually matched what, you know, the, the manufacturer said it was. Yep. There was no methanol in there, for example, uh -huh. or there was no uh, hexanes in there or whatever. So it was, a, it was a good food grade. And it had passed everything except for one. And one of the four from the exact same lot, we had four barrels, the exact same lot, one of the barrels had arsenic in it. Nope. Weird. Weird. So if, really weird. So if we had, it's something with the barrel... Um, so we, of course, contacted the vendor and yep. said, what's up with this? You know, what, what, and then, you know, you got to do a root cause investigation. And for those of you who are involved in quality, those are typically called, uh, you know, that's in your CAPA system, your corrective action, preventative action, yep. you know, yep. so, um, that is something that happened. Don't know why it happened, but if you, if we had used that ethanol in production, we would have that one lot, that one barrel from one lot would have contaminated everything. Everything. Yeah. yeah. If you had not tested it. Right. That would have been bad. Yeah. Um, and we were just going towards a launch, okay? And we would have missed our launch date, number one. Ugh. And we would have had to throw, you know, you know, thousands of dollars worth of, maybe even hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of uh, cannabis away. So wow. not, not a very good thing. That's why it's really good to test. Rather be safe than sorry. Yeah. And then once you get to know your vendors, you can relax the requirements or have them have them do the tests if you still, according to your risk assessment, require that you are, you know, you need to have those tests. So trust and then but of course verify. You, yeah, <laughs> trust but verify. And then of course you can formulate according to the batch record. So cool. that's just kind of an overview of the general process of formulation. You can see that the uh Every, you know, the excipients and what you guys choose to have your excipients, it, it hits on every one of these. Yes, you know, absolutely. You've you, you got to establish those um, organoleptic uh, properties, the viscosity properties up in front. Sure. All your batch size, your manufacturing process, your concentration, all that stuff. So you can see it's all, uh, it's all interconnected with your formula and your packaging. You need to put that uh, requirements up front. So what are some examples of some excipients in hemp formulations? You got ethanol, of yeah. course. You have oils, mm -hmm. uh, MCT, coconut. They can, they're, they're any, there's like hemp oils people use. People use like cranberry oils. I've seen, I've seen all kinds of different oils. Um, sesame seed oil, I've seen that. So things like that. Surfactants, surfactants typically are, would not be in like a, a tincture formulation, nor would you find them in a vaporizer or, you know, you wouldn't find them in a gummy either. Okay. Um, you would find those in more of a oral administration where it went into your gut and th th those are typically have some surfactants or, um, a lot of people use surfactants in water soluble, for example, right? right. Again, it's going into the gut and it, you have a water soluble formulation. So, so like so. in gummies and there's some sweetener, uh, whether that's sugar or, uh, I, I actually tasted something with vegetable glycerin, which was interesting and right. very nice. Is that considered a surfactant then, or is that an, in, another ingredient? You mean VG? Uh, yeah, it depends on... Or the sugar. Or the sugar. Whatever, whatever oh, okay. that would be. Oh, yeah. VG does kind of taste okay, doesn't it? It yeah. tastes great, yeah, it tastes actually. Great. Yeah. And it, PG kind of tastes that way, too. This is uh, propylene glycol and vegetable glycerin, right? Right. People use these as excipients for vaporizers. Why do they do that? Well, because it's been well-known in the industry. It creates a large smoke, a large uh, cloud. Oh, yeah. Right? Oh, that's my world. That's how I roll. Right. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> it also does a good job at solubilizing, right? Sorry. Uh, and, you know, I know, I know you. You got that big cloud all in your office. It's just like you can't see anything. Oh, hey, do you know? Randy's wonder... vaping again. Oh, my gosh. Okay, so I want to, here's a question Jeez. for you out there. This is a little poll question. Okay, are you ready? Does, um, did, was Pigpen just, you know, smoking? Hey, I, I you know Because he had that cloud around him on the Peanuts character, right? <laughs> Didn't he? <laughs> he was just smoking, I guess. I don't know. I just, who's to tell? Sorry. Okay, interact with our bot and find that <laughs> out. Okay. 
<laughs> all right. So terpene blends also peg, um, PG, VG, and SEDS. SEDS is kind of, um, okay, look, for those of you guys who are really into formulations, self-emulsifying systems are, are really great for oral administration. And okay. basically what they do is they encapsulate the... Um, you know, they can be in liposomes, for sure. example, or they can be in other surfactant mixtures that really uh, reduce the droplet size in your stomach. Okay. And therefore, when it gets really, really small, uh, like even into the uh, submicron size, you get a better bioavailability and a better absorption. So this is what people are thinking of. They're using uh, these SEDS formulations. There's not very many of them out on the market, but there are some commercial ones that are available where you can say, hey, look, I'd like a, a SEDS excipient, and I'm going to mix that with my hemp, hemp oil. There's many companies out there that have done a lot of work already on that. They'll give you the formulation. Well, that's cool yeah. because you have to use that because water solubility with oil is kind of a misnomer, right? It, it really yeah. is not true because you, oil is not water soluble, so you right. just make it tiny. You make it tiny and put a surfactant in there so that it will actually, so the energetics are such that you, you will go in yeah. to the water and stay suspended. That's also another thing. I mean, if you're going to do water soluble formulations, you, you know, your excipients uh, are basically surfactants. Yeah. Okay. Very small amounts yeah. or, or they're, um, yeah, they're, and you have to be really careful. There's high shear. Uh, some, yeah. some people do like a lot of high shearing also so they can get the particle size down. But you got to really, again, go back to your requirements, your mm -hmm. organoleptic exactly. requirements. Okay. You may taste the surfactant, for example, and that may not be desirable quality. Correct. That, so that should be in your requirements document. Or maybe when you uh, homogenize it down with your high pressure homogenizer, it, it, it's a little cloudy. Okay, you haven't, you know, you might have said, hey, look, we're, we're really after a clear solution. So um, I use my high pressure homogenizer every day. Oh, yeah? <laughs> you too? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Wow. Yeah, smoothie. <laughs> you just make my smoothie. <laughs> my, uh, okay, so my, my high pressure there. homogenizer. Oh yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> we should do that. Uh, oh, we make yeah. a smoothie. I wonder if we could. Yeah. I think we could. We probably could. I'll bring no in problem. my my my. Do it. What do you got for my Nutribullet? What do you got for oh Nutribullet? Huh? Yeah. So what do you got for uh, what for smoothies these, these these days? Yeah. Oh, actually, I use sprouted. Uh, oh, oatmeal. Oh, my gosh. That's I gross. I do. <laughs> I use sprouted oatmeal. Sprouted oatmeal? Are you kidding steel me? steel-cut oatmeal. Oh, do you do like a do. microbial test on it before you really? Uh, I don't know. You add no. water and heat and you know, oh. so they get little sprouts? Well, you have to. Wow. That's, that's special. It's really good for you. <laughs> okay. Yes. And I do chia well, seeds and yeah. I do oh, maca. Chia seeds, uh, okay. Oh, right. maca. That's uh, mushrooms, steps. right? The, 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 Maca, oh, no, maca is that, that the that, root the from, root oh okay. from the Andes. Okay. Wow. Oh, it's really good. Yeah, I do I do all of that. Okay. Yeah. Would I be able to drink this or Yes. Okay. I have had people who are green smoothie phobic try mine and they're like they look at it and they go eh. and then <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure. And, and and they try it and they're like, know. Oh, it's not as bad as it looks. No, this would be a better <laughs> poll question. Who <laughs> Come on. Uh, we should I'll get you my recipe for my smoothie. And it has all kinds of stuff. I mean, I got spirulina. I've got everything in it. And then I put seven dark cherries in it and then some blueberries. Oh, you mean, not protein. the maraschino cherries, the other ones, the ones that are sitting yeah. in the... Yeah. In what the, do they call those? Yeah. The, well, we we the, have our, our little... The candied ones? ...tarted cherries back here from Door County. Door County, yeah. Oh, yeah. But, you know, they're kind of sitting in some alcohol. Yeah. So they're really good. Yeah. But I don't good. put those in my smoothie. Okay. I put those in a Manhattan. Oh, yes. <laughs> Speaking of that. Yes. We should do some Manhattan sometime soon. Like now? No. Uh, oh. <laughs> maybe in about 10 minutes after we're done here. <laughs> is it okay. still? It's not noon yet. <laughs> oh, no, it is past, just oh, okay. past noon. <laughs> all right. All right, guys. Uh, okay. Sorry. Back on track. What are the examples of uh, excipients? We I think we've path, through, we, we? <laughs> we went. Uh, how do we do that? Dude? That's, okay. That's my job. To okay. Take what are the requirements You're for welcome, excipients? By the way. <laughs> Stability, solubility, viscosity, organoleptic, non allergenic, uh, non toxic. That's how you spell organoleptic. Uh, yeah. Organoleptic. Uh, organoleptic. That's the smell, clarity, color, yes. taste, other, yeah. other, um, like uh, one. I don't know, would a cloud formation be considered an organoleptic 
quality? P possibly, yeah. I, I, don't I would know. say Because yes. it would, you know, yeah, I think it would be. Yes. Yeah, and I don't know how you'd put specifications on that, but uh, you must be compatible with the delivery. So there's just some ideas for requirements for you guys. Where to get excipients, I, I don't have to tell you, but you get them from chemical companies. There are companies that specialize in pharmaceutical excipients. Yep. What's wonderful about those guys is that they... They lock control everything. They give you like a very extended uh, certificate of analysis. Yep. And they, if they're suppliers to existing pharmaceutical companies, they won't have any problems with signing or supplying, uh, you know, your vendor qualification form. Or if it's really critical and the risk is really high, you can also sign a quality agreement with your vendor. Yep. Um, and and they do it. Yeah. I mean, companies like DuPont do this all, yeah. all day, every day. And you, you can get that. And there are natural and synthetically created excipients. There are. Yes, Correct. Are. Correct. So, yeah. And a lot of times when you go into a chemical company, oftentimes that's synthetically right. created. Right. Okay. I mean, yeah, one of the things that, uh, like with fats uh, and, uh, you know, like uh, oils and what things like that, they, they you know, you, sometimes you have, like some of the oils can become rancid af over time, okay? Oh. <clears throat> so if you're buying from a distributor or a wholesaler and they don't put any, you know, expiration date or any manufacturing date or anything <laughs> like that, that would be you may have free radicals in there. You don't know how it's been processed. Maybe if you, you have, you know, if you're getting some soy-based oils, maybe it's been processed with hexane. For example, maybe there's residuals in there. Hey, guys, you got to know about all that stuff. So just do your homework on your excipients. Um, I tend to shy away from distributors and wholesalers because I don't know, you know, what do they got like six vats in the back and they're, they're filling it up and putting a sticker on it and sending it out to you. So that's why I also stay away from, uh, you know, I stay away from like, you know, sourcing ingredients on Amazon. Sure. Um, I try to stay away from that. If they can provide you the quality documentation that you need, then yeah, maybe. But yeah. And you have the ability be. to test also. And you have the ability to test it also. So and that's also why I don't go to the grocery store because you don't, you can't really guarantee that the SKUs are in there. If you're starting out for R&D, I think it's perfectly fine. And then you would want to hand over the, your formulation to your buyer. Your buyer would then go out and, and I don't mind going something. to the grocery store because I, I like to eat. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I do too. Okay. What is required for documentation for excipients? So the, the very fundamental first thing you need to have in your documentation repertoire is the MSDS, the, which is the material safety data sheet. The material safety data sheet. Yeah. That MSDS. is, that's basically something that you have to have for every one of your excipients. So when you get your MSDS, you need to make sure that you update your chemical inventory. So for those of you guys who are formulators in R&D, I'm speaking to you guys. Go do the go do the stuff. You got MSDS. So you're going to put your MSDS in there, and then you're going to update your chemical inventory. Your chemical inventory uh, affects a lot of different things, including you know your you got to have that in your fire analysis, and you got to have uh, for insurance purposes. And usually you add in a quantity in there. If your excipient is uh, flammable, you need to make sure that you have the proper storage requirements. Okay, is, is it gonna go into a, a flammable cabinet? Um, do I have the proper control areas that have already been uh, you know, discussed and delineated? So those are some of the things that you need to think about when you're talking about excipients. The lot number, obviously, right? Absolutely. I mean, certificates of analysis, you should be getting those in with your, with your lot. COA, yeah. yes. Look, if you don't, if you get uh, an excipient and you don't get your certificate of analysis with it, you're either you're going to have to do it yourself and have accept reject criteria, or you're going to have to get it from the vendor. Okay, yep. and it's much better to get it from the vendor actually. Absolutely. Vendor qualification document, guys. This is something that that uh, you R and D guys uh, always like to push off to you know maybe upstream, maybe going to the buyer or whatever. But you can qualify and build quality right into your R and D process yes. right from the get go. You don't need to wait for those guys to do it. So just send them the form; they'll fill it out, and then you have that documentation handed over to your quality assurance manager. They'll file it up, and maybe when you go to your uh, final analysis or your final review for release to production for your formulation and you have your, th that's going to be a part of the package that you deliver sure. for review. Okay. Packaging specifications would also be there. Now, what am I talking about? Pack packaging specifications for the excipient itself. Yep. 
Okay, this is for example what's coming we, into you to yeah. use as the ingredient. So we had the barrel, right? The okay. barrel was a problem. Yep. yep. Right? Because why was the barrel a problem? Well, because it had yep. had arsenic in it. Yep. Or you get, you know, coconut oil or MCT oil in the right, right you know, secured jug with all of the right dates and COAs right. and everything on it. All of that. And, yeah. Or bags of product, you know, that's really well done. Your expiration yep. date as well? Yep. Um, the other thing would be uh, that if, you know, not all vendors are equal, guys. So if, you, you know, if you're buying from Amazon and buying in low quantities, that's great. But if you go to a specialized excipient vendor, they will have long-term stability data for you, oh. which is pretty nice that so that nice. you can... You can basically say, okay, well, here's my, you know, here's my stability data. They have data packages. You just got to ask for it. Okay. So ask. Um, one of those things that you need to think about. That's cool. I didn't know that was available. Yeah. So how to qualify an excipient for use. Okay. Test, 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 of course. Mm -hmm. Test for potency, purity, identity. Mm -hmm. Test for your metals, toxins, and microbials. Yep. And test for pesticides. Look, what you want to do is just to make sure that you, uh, like I said, you, you have the excipient that you're putting in, you're formulating your product. Mm -hmm. The R&D guys, you should do these tests ahead of time to make sure that, okay, the, at least the lots that you are using are not going to be contaminating your um, form, full formulation. And, and basically, if you, if you do these steps ahead of time, I, you'll, you'll solve a lot of, you know, pain down, down the road. Now, in order to do all of these tests, can you use an HPLC for some of them? Do you need a GC headspace for some of them? What do you need? Well, okay. So, first of all, if you don't have the laboratory in-house, which is great, you can just, you know, spend a little bit of extra money to go and check on, on these excipients. I mean, this is a part of caring. Oh, okay. This is a part of your brand promise. Yep. This is really what I'm talking about. It's about caring about the products that you put out and the quality of the products that you put out. Okay. Um, yeah, you can go buy it from anywhere and just glug, 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 and, you know, just ship it out. Okay. Oh, it's got a contaminant. I'll just, I'll just dilute it. Okay. That, oh, there's a lot of people who are out there, you know, bathtub chemistry. You don't want to do bathtub chemistry because, first of all, it's a liability. You know, some people are really conscious of what they're taking in, and yes. if you don't have and the industry the right is growing tests, that way, yeah. all day, every day. Yeah. So, look, guys, you just just learn to love the extra work. Um, so, how to qualify an excipient for use? Uh, when you're talking about qualification of the excipient, you take the requirements that you guys have all decided on, yep. and and you match that with the actual tests. Yep. And uh, there may be some of the requirements that you don't actually have tests for, like organic, sure. you know, like uh, organoleptic stuff, yep. you know, like smell or whatever. Sure. Um, but if you get an oil and it smells like hexane, you know, you could just yeah. say it should be odorless, right? Yes, okay, exactly. so that, that would be something that you could yeah. test, actually, and say, yes, it passes or not. Yeah, it right? wouldn't be good if it smelled like hexane. No. Okay, so what is a vendor quality agreement for? Look, guys, you don't need to really be hyper hyped up on vendor quality agreements unless you're in a GMP world, okay? And within a GMP world, that's where they come into play. Usually they're used for active ingredients, sure. okay? Usually they're also predicated based on risk. So the risk, obviously, with an active ingredient is that it would have a contaminant in there or something along those lines. So in those cases, you might want to have a quality agreement associated with your vendor, a vendor relationship. Okay. And really what that is, is that's just assuring that your vendor is following CGMP, okay? And um, that means that their equipment, their facilities, the training, uh, the cleaning, uh, the cleaning validation, process validation, process SOPs, all that stuff has been reviewed. And we're all agreeing that you're going to follow your process as you have presented it to us, and uh, you're going to keep documentations on that process. That, and so it is a, it's a legal agreement in between two parties, Absolutely. one with a vendor and one with, a, one with a, um, you know, actual someone who's going to purchase. So yeah. the purchaser. And vendor. SOPs are critical. And I think that that was a good nudge saying that's we're probably heading there next. Yeah, in, we are. In some of the shows to come. Yeah. I think, uh, yeah, next uh, next time we're going to do some SOPs. We're going to go over some batch records. We're going to talk about what everything goes into a batch record. So it's going to be kind of fun to, SOPs to check SOPs are critical when you're working on that. So, yeah. you know, they're very good. So that's, that's uh, kind that's of just the overview of excipients. And so we know what an excipient is. Mm -hmm. We know that there are natural and synthetically created excipients where you can get them. 
you know, what they're used for. And, you know, you absolutely need excipients right. in, in everything that you're doing. Yeah, they're, uh, yeah. You need it. You, you need them. And are they all created equal? No. Right. Test. This is good. Yeah. I, 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 this was very helpful Great. for me. Thanks. Uh, I, I appreciate this. This, this is good. I, I learned something. Of course, I learned something all the time. Well, good for you. I'm open. You get the gold star. Mm-hmm. Yes. <laughs> Daddy-o. That's what I get. <laughs> that's, what I, that's what I look for. And, and what's interesting is when we're talking about these, there, there are binders. And I, is that why you brought in the big three ring binders? Because there are binders in excipients as part of I have I have at least a, a, a two foot stack of binders, don't I? <laughs> he really does. You should see his office. It's like, whoa, that's good. Anyway, thank you for being here. This was a, an awesome episode. We're looking forward to seeing you next time. The team is, you know, o- online answering questions, setting things up. If you've got more detailed questions, you want to set up a CBD jam session, go ahead and do that. Um, at work, we're, we're excited. This is good. Excipients. Now you are the expert. Yeah. It's well good. done. Good All job. Right, take care. Thanks. Thanks a lot, guys. Thank you. Hot mic, hot mic. Hot uh, mic. Woo. <laughs> are you stuck in your hemp or cannabis business? Are you not reaching your processing goals? Here at Extract Lab, we offer a free 20 minute CBD jam session. A CBD jam session is a conversation with an industry expert, not a sales call. A conversation where you can talk to us about whatever issues you are having right now and where you are stuck. We will help you uncover any issues you are currently having in your business, create a solution to fit your current scale, develop a future scale-up plan based on your needs, and help you make your processing goals a reality, all while getting your business plan back on track. Schedule your free 20-minute CBD jam session at 1-651-600-0036. Again, that number is 1-651-600-0036.